So the, some of the cool things are, one, it's encrypted using a, uh, a key derived from your seed. So no one else but you can decrypt it unless you also have the seed. Um, now, this file gets updated when a channel is opened and closed. So the reason being is it's called a static channel backup. It only backs up the channel parameters. It doesn't back up the actual like states of the channel, for example. Um, when you, when you create a channel, you don't know the HLCs that you're going to forward. You don't know the pre-images of the pre payment hatches that might come. So you basically back up all the channel parameters that can allow you to sweep outputs from that channel back to your wallet in case of like total disaster uh, and you need to like recover the funds. <coughs> um, let's see. So in addition to that, uh, more or less, the, so the other thing it contains in addition to this like key deviation and the CSV constraints is the addresses that you need to reach your peer. That's because when you restore with uh, the static channel backups, you'll enter what's called the DLP protocol. Where you'll basically connect out to those peers, tell them like, "Hey, I need you to close the channel. Like, I don't think we can continue." They'll the remote party will force close, and then you'll be able to sweep your funds back to your wallet. Um, and let's see, yeah. So that allows you to sweep the funds in back from their remote equipment back to your seed, um, and then you can take those funds and start a new sort of like wallet if you like. Um, but it doesn't allow you to that sort of recover like state and continue operation as if you had never lost data. That does not exist because that has like some potential. Foot guns that we tried to avoid with this one. So this is like a first initial, a pretty major step in terms of like increasing the safety of, of people's funds. Uh, there have been people that have lost data uh, and just have sort of lost some money. So this is the first step in trying to uh, make a safe way that we can start uh, encouraging people to use and uh, sort of increasing the safety of people's funds within the network. Um, it also comes with, ooh, I told you at the beginning my number's wrong. There are five new RPCs. Uh, related to <laughs> I'm off by one. <laughs> uh, there are five new RPCs that come with a uh, six, and they are export channel backup, export all, verify, subscribe channel backups, and restore channel backups. Um, the first one allows you to back up, to create like a backup for a single channel. Um, this will allows you, to, if you say have a channel that's very valuable, or a channel you maybe have some specific constraints around how you want to back it up, you can target that specific channel and maybe distribute it via different avenues. Export all obviously does everything all at once. Um, verify will allow you to take a backup created by either the first two, and then you submit it back and say, like, is this valid? Uh, can I decrypt it? Does it have all the information I need? Um, subscribe channel backups is an alternative for the FS notify approach that we discussed earlier. Uh, instead of actually like listening to the file for modifications, you can just subscribe to that, and that will give you them over the RPC. Um, the data, the data contained in those is essentially equivalent. So it's up to you really how you'd like to use it. And then finally, there's restore channel backups, which will take. Uh, any any of these sort of like uh, backups produced by the RPCs, and then initiate this sort of recovery protocol, of trying to restore them, contacting peers, and recovering funds and sending them back to your wallet. Um, Lalu was also kind enough to bless us with this recovery doc, which is like a pretty incredibly thorough documentation of how of all the recovery procedures available in LMD, what your seed can and cannot do for you, um, how you use static channel backups, um, and a host of things like that. So I suggest checking out if you run an LMD node. Uh, it's good to be aware of sort of the things that, that you are and aren't protected by, and hopefully like that list will become more complete as we, um, well, the list of things not covered will get more complete. Um, so. All right, um, so next. So like I said, that was one of the flagship features. I'm gonna go into a lot of, uh, into the gossip improvements right now, because this was like a major uh, concern of ours, sort of like ending, or really beginning in March, as the network kind of like really topped up of like, 40k channels, more or less. Um, the the gossip is probably one of the heaviest of, like systems of the Lightning Network right now, just because there's a lot of a lot of traffic, there's a lot of nodes, a lot of verification. It's more or less like big, like the Lightning Network's mempool in some sense. And as the as the network grew, like it became even more costly to like sort of maintain this and verify and keep up with it all. What was not what was not helping with that issue was there was a bug in like Node Five. That would uh, well, I guess I'll let me describe the problem first. Basically, channels can be either enabled or disabled via like a bit set on your uh, like channel announcement. Sorry, channel update. You can then like change that by broadcasting to the network again and like flipping the bit or some other, or other parameters in the channel update. Um, and there was a bug in prior versions that would cause that to flip very fast. And so if you were if anyone was like watching the, the gossip traffic come in, you can see like enabled disabled enabled disabled. And it was like that's a lot of verification, signature checking, um, database operations. So in Node App 6, we rewrote that all from scratch. We basically like, uh, designed like, a better state machine that would like, dampen any sort of effects of like, peers flapping um, so that like, you won't send an update exactly when every peer like, flips on and off. It would like, dampen all those effects and try to converge on some sort of steady state. 
And we also like gave us a bit um, a greater ability to test that. So we have a lot of like unit tests around this, and so we're pretty confident that like this will actually hit um, sort of this oscillation on the network. And part of the reason those nodes were flapping were, was because they would like um, was because exactly because of the gossip traffic. They would like get overwhelmed by like doing gossip syncing with their peers, and they disconnect, and then they reconnect, and then they do the whole thing over and over again. So. A lot of these, like a lot of these improvements, are all sort of like very well intertwined, intertwined um, in such a way that like they all sort of collectively improve the stability. Um, but this is one of the ones that if you now like look at all the gossip traffic, you'll see a far like fewer number of these like sort of flipping updates. Um, so that's fortunately now been fixed. Let's see. Um, zombie channels. How many people know what zombie channels are? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Fair number. So. Uh, LMD will prune the zombie channel after uh, two weeks. This is the recommended. This is the recommended parameter in bolt four. Um, maybe other people clarify. This is, I don't know. Does CLI prune after two weeks? I don't know. But, yeah. Everyone does. Everyone does. Yeah. So, um, so basically, uh, a zombie channel is one where you have not received an update in like a new update with a timestamp within two weeks. So if I have a channel, but it has no update that's been signed and broadcast by either node on either side for two weeks, it's considered a zombie, and we assume that then the node is like gone permanently offline, it's stale, they can't reconnect or something. Um, and for those reasons, we we actually like we used to delete them on disk. Uh, and there's a couple issues with that. One is that, um, well, not all the nodes prune at the same time in the network. They might determine that a node is a zombie at different times than others. Um, like not all the nodes may apply the same policy. Like a new implementation might choose to do this after a week. Um, some may do it after three. It's really up to them. Um, and the bigger, the biggest issue of all is like after I delete all data about this channel, how do I know it was a zombie? Um, if like if if I have no information about this channel, how do I know in the past that I that I had deleted it? Uh, and the result of this is you can imagine if um, a bunch of people in a room were all pruning at different times and syncing up with each other, and no one knows which zombie channels they deleted. Um, you end up with this effect of the zombie channels like sloshing around the network, um, where like I would delete it, then a minute later someone would sync with me and be like, oh, that's a new channel, I'll get it, then I'll broadcast that to all my peers right after he prunes it, and then I'll like send it to him, and the process keeps going. So you end up with this huge like like droves. It looks like it was like the White Walkers like coming through, <laughs> <laughs> and you you just watch it. It was like every 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 hour you just get like hammered with like all these things. So, um, and that eats up a ton of things. There's there's a lot of bandwidth CPU and like uh, database operations that are involved with that. So, um, this was like a huge issue that we saw, and actually is probably one of the major things that like sped up the 0.6 release. We had a couple other like major milestones planned, but um, really decided that we should fix this up. Uh, just because like the network stability was like really suffering as a result, so um, so here's some of the things we did to address it. For one, is we started actually persisting which nodes we uh, or which channels we deem zombies, and this allows us to delete most of the data. There's probably like uh, I'm gonna guess about probably like eight or nine hundred more bytes that you're able to delete. But what we, the one thing we do keep is the actual pub keys of the nodes involved. And the reason is because you need to know if you see a future channel output that actually like resurrects the zombie into like a live channel, you have to you have to know how to validate that channel. And so we keep the pub keys around just for that sake. Um, but other than that, we're able to delete virtually all data. Um, so combined with like the short channel ID, it's about 74 bytes of zombie <coughs> at 3,300 on the network. That puts us at around 250 kilobytes on disk, which is like pretty minimal. But it's pretty much prevents this entire problem uh, of this like you know the White Walkers coming and stuff like that. Um, so the improvement here is that like now I can actually check if I've historically deemed this channel as a zombie. Um, I can immediately reject it from my peers if they send it to me. If um, you know maybe maybe the other person doesn't have this zombie training or this person says zombie index. If they send it to me, I can immediately verify that oh, I've already done that and discard it. Um, you can avoid when seeking with other peers and they send you channels that they know about to like filter through and then ask them and request from them. I can say like oh no I already know that's a zombie don't request that. And so, and vice versa. If someone is, um, if someone tries to like offer me zombies, uh, or no, sorry, if, I, if someone is sending from me, I can also use this index to say, I'm not going to give that zombie channel to you because I don't want to like burden you with something that is probably a zombie. And if you give them somewhere else, that's fine. But you're not going to give it to me. So all in all, uh, there's two PRs kind of right at the bottom that you can like check out if you're interested. Uh, but this, for the most part, from what I've seen, is like mostly solve the issue and. 
you know, once once like a majority knows like upgrade to O.6, this issue for the most part ceased to exist. So that was a pretty that was a pretty major win, and uh, one of the things that we were like really anxious to like ship out to the emperor. Let's see, another related change is uh, which is like the most of a lot of work that we were put into uh, is the gossip sync manager, and so more it would be with O.5. You would come up, and with all your peers, you'd sort of do this like gossip sync protocol, like as soon as you connected. Um, and what that would do is, especially like if you consider when you're restarting your node, and you have 200 peers or a thousand peers like Rompert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe there were zombies got them. <laughs> like, but um, you basically come up and initially and immediately start syncing with like 200,000 peers, all trying to get the exact same data. Uh, and you basically, you probably, a lot of people will, like have issues where they boom on restarts or like um, have to like block ports or block like, block point ports so that you can actually restart to, s to a sufficient portion of your peers, then allow the other ones to connect. So there's some issues there. Um, and what we decided to do with O.6 was to actually basically s be more selective about who we do syncs with and just be more intelligent about it. So now when you come up, you will only uh, do gossip syncs with like three peers at a time. Um, actually, that's incorrect. You will actively listen for new updates at SIP. Basically, think of this as like a Bitcoin mempool. You're going to listen for new updates in the mempool from only three peers at a time. Um, you will also, as soon as you come up, you'll try to do like a historical sync with someone. So you'll basically pick one peer, do a, a full sync with them, and then every twenty every twenty minutes, you'll try and like spot check that with like all your other peers. Um, this is mostly going to be like a no op. Like you've already synced all the channels. You might find like one or two, but for the most part, it'll be. Um, Pretty bandwidth efficient, and so that prevents you. That prevents a lot of this, uh, um, this like redundant bandwidth that you would see on a startup. So it, it basically is more intelligent in that sense. And the three peers at a time greatly reduces your bandwidth. I can tell by looking at my peers who is updated and who's not. So if you're in this room, <laughs> yeah, the, the prior version of Ellen, he had like a really uh, deterministic sort of uh, bandwidth profile. And if you just look look at them all on a list, you can see like who's updated. And who's so <laughs> now it's a little bit more sporadic because it's actually some rotation and randomization stuff in there. But um, let's see. So yeah, that. So together, these things sort of. Uh, yeah, um, that'll lead to sort of like the eventual discovery of like all the channels known to all your peers by doing this like rotation thing. Um, and like I said, my node, which has about fifty-five channels or so, saw about ninety-five percent reduction in bandwidth. Um, and. And that was before anyone updated, right? That was just, that was, so I saw 95% reduction in incoming because most of what this optimizes is how much I request from my peers. As soon as everyone updated to 0.6, or the majority of you, um, you know, you got similar savings to sort of what you have people requesting from you. And so uh, if you updated if you updated 0.6, you probably saw similar um, similar improvements. And if you were like a large routing node like y'all or something, you would have even more. Um, all right, another cool feature. Uh, this was the work of Yoast, who is our, one of our developers from the Netherlands. Uh, the Sweeper is a new batching engine in LND. This is uh, sort of the future of how we do our like transaction management, transaction batching uh, internally. Uh, we used to use a subsystem called the UTX owner stream, uh, which was sort of responsible for like raising children and outputs that were like time locked uh, <laughs> until they were mature enough to sweep. But we've um, we've sort of ditched that in favor of this more generic like. Uh, <coughs> abstraction of like this batching engine and more or less what it does is it'll take like if I have channels closing at any given time it'll ask them like hey do you need any sweeps and if they give me like inputs of sweeps then they'll take those back into the transaction sign it broadcast it and it'll continue to do this for all the channels that need to have like uh, active sweep requests at the time um, it will basically it'll sweep all outputs so like let's say um, let's say I have an output that only has like 20,000 sats in it but the feed rate is like 50 sats a byte uh, that output cannot pay for itself, right? It's just, it costs too much to spend it versus like what I'm gonna get in return. So the sweeper will actually compute like a sort of yield for each input um, and determine like if the input is actually even able to pay for itself. And like, so you know, there's, there's like a metric that you can like tune there and say like, I would like to only sweep if like, I get a third of the output back or something like that. Um, and so that's, that's pretty cool. So basically like postpone those ones that can't pay for themselves and just literally are not worth sleeping. And so P rate sort of subdue and then you can actually like get them in. Um, so I thought that was a pretty cool feature. Um, in the future, we'll actually probably move to a design where almost all uh, transactions, 
all like all transaction flows into channels, out of channels, on chain, out of like you know, all that sort of stuff. We'll go through the sweeper primarily because it's a central batching engine and it can do things like I'm sweeping this I want to sweep this channel, but instead of sweeping it back to the wallet, I'm just going to go create a channel. So you skip uh, you skip the non-chain transaction going into the wallet and then back out as a channel. So you say fees, all sorts of stuff, and those sorts of storage has to be taken in a lot of different places. Um, so I think all in all, we're pretty excited about uh, sort of the future direction of that. And for any of those who are who have been running a, uh, a node long enough to remember what a strategic continuum is, um, those stuff will be gone pretty soon as a result of this. What is it? <laughs> well, so one of the things that we one of the things we found is that the ETX under sheet was ended up being sort of like too rigid in its initial design, and um, it wasn't as tolerant to just like uh, the, like fees spiking or things like that, and there would be an issue on startup where like you you literally could not start LD, um, and your option was don't start LD <laughs> or add this one uh, this one line of code called a continue that would basically skip the error and just proceed as if nothing happened, and, <laughs> and it broke and that broke so a lot of assumptions in the ETH so industry about like uh, the order of things that happened and like what things it had processed and what didn't. But when the option when the alternative was just not starting your node until it gets fixed, which is <laughs> until 0.6, and this is like 0.4, uh, that was basically like your only option. So I think people actually made a t-shirt at one point that said strategic continue on it. <laughs> um, it was one of the like earlier earlier jokes in the LND slide. Thank you, Robert. Um, so there are, there are two new like primary RPCs added to like LND main RPC server uh, that you guys might be interested in. One is list unspent. This is the work of uh, Adam Gibson who added that for us. So it kind of mimics uh, Bitcoin to use list unspent again. It'll show you all the UTXOs in your wallet, uh, their confirmation height, um, or sorry, confirmation depth, um, like the addresses, stuff like that, and how much is in each one. Uh, I find this pretty helpful because I just have a, a little, I have like an LND top kind of command that I just run and I just like always see like all the confirmations updating and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, subscribe channels, this is actually added by Valentin, or by Val, is she here? No, she's in, somewhere else. No, she's in New York. Oh, that's right. Uh, well, Valen, Val, uh, subscribe channel. <laughs> 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 it's okay. I can see in the dark. So yeah, uh, like I was saying, subscribe channel is another RPC that is pretty useful. Um, it'll give you notifications on like sort of major channel events, like when it becomes active or inactive. That means like the peer connects, we uh, set channel reestablish, and so sort of the channel is up and like can be used for active, uh, actively forwarding payments. And you know the opposite of that when they disconnect, then that no longer becomes the case. And also when a channel closes, so uh, I think there's the future will also do channel openings, but it's already a lot of The subscriber can see channel opens too. Oh, I didn't open that. Okay, so it does all of it. It does everything. So, um, so um, yeah, and this is especially useful, like we, we found this useful in developing um, the Lightning app. The Lightning app prior would just sit there and pull uh, list channels, basically give you like this page of like all your channel statuses, which is one like, um, for all, all you guys know, like, long polling is not the best way to make you lie. It leads to like a lot of like overhead and CPU and stuff like that, deserialization. Um, instead, you're going to have LND tell you when all these events happen and you can update the UI responsibly. Um, so we find this incredibly helpful and it basically like, you know, it makes your UIs and stuff snappier and more responsive. Um, in addition, there's some, these are some fun new uh, projects that we worked on. Uh, were, they, were any of them in about five? Yeah, so we've, uh, we've been doing a lot of under the hood work. Uh, there are now six new optional subservers that you can like sort of compile into LD via what we call build tags. Um, and they're basically, if anyone's done LNCLI-L, there's like a huge list of things. And the main goal here was to start breaking that up um, because that, that means we have one giant profile. Uh, they're all sort of intertwined and really they can be packaged up into much sort of like nicer modular units. Um, it also allows us to like um, be a little more ambitious in terms of like uh, refactoring, redesigning, uh, a lot like being a little bit more experimental and allowing like breaking changes to happen while we like work out the kinks of this RPC um, or, or of the specific RP RPC commands and semantics. Um, but I'll go kind of through briefly what they all are. Uh, the autopilot RPC is you can use to like actually manage specific aspects of autopilot. If the um, prior to this you actually had to like Restart LND to turn autopilot on and off. Wait, wait, for those that may not know, autopilot is. Yes, autopilot is uh, the automated channel opening <coughs> system within LND. It'll basically look at the graph and various heuristics and decide, like, oh, I want to put funds here. 
And this allows you to toggle that on and off, so that's useful. You can actually have a, a button in the app where you hit on and off, and it doesn't need to like kill the app and then restart the app just to like have that take effect. Um, there's also um, some cool things there. You can also like actually provide it your own heuristics. So I can like if I have some sort of scoring system on the nodes that I'd like to connect to, I can weight them, and Autopilot will take in those scores, and then it will sort of like uh, when it goes to create new channels, it'll weight them according to that, and that'll be sort of like the probability more or less of how they will connect to those nodes. Um, so that's really useful if you have your own um, scoring preference or like metric or sort of like metrics that you've been gathering on specific nodes and channels. You can use that sort of inform where your automated service opens channels for users. Um, the chain RPC is also really useful. It exposes one of the internal subsystems of LND, which is the chain notifier. This allows you to uh, be notified on block events. Whenever any block comes in, you can uh, ask for confirmations or spends of transaction IDs or outputs. Or, yeah, or outputs. Um, and you can also do this based on scripts. The uh, reason for that is that like neutrino, neutrino matching is all done via scripts. So you can basically do like outpoint scripts, um, pretty much anything you want, JSIDs, and it'll all handle that for you depending on how you like to like have your application set up. Um, there's the invoices RPC, which allows you to create um, and modify invoices. This one has its own like macro room that you can basically say like I only want this person to be able to create invoices. Here's a macro room. That's all you're allowed to do to collect my own email. Um, the router RPC is. Um, in charge of handling all the payments. You can uh, sort of request routes, or you can like actually facilitate make payments, uh, pay invoices, stuff like that. So this is actually like a really big, uh, this is actually still a really big ongoing effort. It's something that will continue to be refactored in OS 7. Uh, because we're, we're working on like um, the fine, we're working on fine tuning sort of the piece of um, what information is like critical when you send payments, how do you deliver like the error messages and stuff like that back to the user. Um, it's, it's a very difficult problem. Um, and so expect to have some more changes there on like the exact semantics of that RPC subserver, but uh, I think in the long run it'll be very powerful because with the with the current one in the main RPC server, we're kind of like locked into like people's behaviors and what they expect of that RPC server. But this gives us a lot of freedom to like basically sort of redesign that from scratch and see like, oh wow, we make this like an even better experience for people. So highly suggest rec uh, playing around with it and you know giving feedback stuff like that. Um, the sign RPC allows you to access the direct like uh, signing keys of the wallet. So you can basically give it uh, like a bit 44 derivation path and it will like sign a message for you. Um, yeah, so it'll give you direct signing access to a lot of things. So this will allow you to like specifically craft transactions using the wallet over RPC um, and make on chain transactions if you wish. And similarly, the wallet kit will has similar functionality but it doesn't expose like the direct signing capabilities if I'm not mistaken. So you can like send transactions, um, you can, you can, you can like publish, stuff like that. So for example, like Loop, Loop I think uses the chain, wallet, signing, and invoices. For those who don't know Loop is. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It uses the wallet but autopilot. What is Loop? Loop is a new service that we offer for like uh, trustlessly moving your balance onto and off of uh, the Lightning Network. So you can swap Lightning balance or Lightning. Uh, you can swap balance in your Lightning channels to an on-chain output, and then soon come. We will have the vice versa where you can actually take an on-chain output and like push funds back into your wallet. So this allows you to like uh, actively maintain the balance of your channel. Um, so I can I can make a channel with my partner, put in a BTC, move it out to on-chain. So I still have one BTC in my custody, but now I can actually receive one BTC back through my channel. So if you're a merchant that needs to be able to like facilitate a lot of volume uh, in the incoming direction, you can sort of attach to the trust or channel relationship with peers and also then use this to receive them at capacity without having the other person have to put it up for you. If that makes sense. Isn't that a great poll? Is it what? Isn't the, the last part you described great poll? Uh, what's your definition of great poll? Oh, uh, just you could request it and um, the service provider is going to have to actually use the on chain as their own. So then if the user doesn't carry out the central part of the operation, it's almost like they have a. We just um, make it a big push to So you have to pay for it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In theory, yes. But we have we have protections against that, so don't try. Uh, just ask me for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess there's some final things. Um, and I only put mis miscellaneous because I, there's too much to write about them individually. But these were like all like a lot of work that um, probably been ongoing for 
couple months before uh, that six was finally released, but I'll try to go through them just a little bit just to give you kind of like an overview of what they are. Um, so going back to the like all the story we talked about about gossip and how um, what's an issue that was and the performance that will be there. Um, a lot of those operations that we're doing were like hitting the database every single time. You would, oh, have I seen this note? Scan the database, like check the database. Oh, is this a, is this a zombie channel? Check the database. And you know when you're processing when you have 200 peers or just like the, the network grows any like any more than it is today. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of contention on the database just to do like these very simple sanity checks. So the reject cache allows you to ver like hold we hold as like, a tiny tiny summary about 25 bytes per channel uh, of the entire graph in memory, and we can do most of like the uh, sanity check like is this a new time is this a new update does this channel exist is it a zombie uh, all those queries can be done from memory without even having the database now. Um, the channel caches allow you to respond to other peers queries. So when someone says like hey I want to do a, a huge sync. Uh, you will basically keep a cache of sort of like the last, well, it, we keep about 20 megabytes in memory right now, um, of just channel updates and channel announcements that are like sort of like pre deserialized. Prior, you would go to this for every peer that requested them and deserialize them and then send them out. So we can actually like respond to them much faster because the majority of them are now like already in memory and just keep being written out uh, on the wire. So that, that ended up being like, if you restart with the 0.6 node, um, a lot of the performance improvement on initial restart is due to these caches being able to like in, like swiftly filter out like traffic from your peers that it doesn't need, and also uh, respond to the queries that they have. So that's probably like uh, that's one of the major reasons that you'll see like a pretty big improvement in startup. Um, batch pre-image writes. So this has to do with HTLC forwarding. If I um, if I forward a payment and the pre-image actually comes back and the HTLC is being settled. Uh, in a prior prior version, of LNB would like sort of write these serially in like a background task to disk, um, and this version of LNB actually takes all of those uh, it, it adds them at the level of the commit transaction. So whenever we like actually write a commit transaction to disk, it'll take all the previews into the memory and commit them at one point um, instead of doing it in the background. And now it does it in line, but this actually turned out to be a performance improvement, even with the uh, the extra write in the critical path, um, just due to like the reduced contention around the number of, of updates and Primarily because there's like uh, far fewer DB transactions because you can batch say four or five hundred all into one transaction. Um, another major improvement was uh, deprioritizing gossip traffic. I think Claire already did this. I think C Lightning started to do this a little bit back, but uh, you might have been the last one to actually with this. But um, there's there's sort of like two primary classes of traffic on, in Lightning Network. One is like um, one is the gossip traffic, just all this endless you know and cool stuff that's floating around. And the other is, you know, very important messages, very critical messages like, I want to make a channel with you. Here's an HTLC. Um, all of those ones, you actually, you know, or in particular, also channel reestablished um, because there's a deadline that when I text someone about how quickly, if I don't give them a channel reestablished at a certain time, then the channel is being active for the duration of the connection. Um, so those messages are very important. So we actually, okay, perfect. I'm, this is the last slide. Um, so we now uh, sort of like segregate those into two distinct like queues that appear. All the important messages go through first, and then only once those are done do we send any gossip messages. So you'll you'll notice that like uh, reconnect the peers is like, more reliable. We'll be able to like reestablish channels even in the face of like large gossip bursts, um, all that sort of stuff. So that was that was a pretty big improvement. Unified sig pool. Um, before each channel will have its own sig pool. Um, sig pool is just like we keep a couple of node routines around that uh, are there for like signing and validating HDLCs, but you only have say maybe eight CPUs at most. Um, so it doesn't really make sense to have eight times the number of channels you have. So this version of LMD actually consolidates all that down into like a single SQL that they all share. Um, since you can only do as much computation as you have like CPU cores. Um, and the final one is like the read and write pools. Those are like a pretty big improvement in terms of like uh, conserving memory when allocating and reading uh, messages from like a huge, huge number of peers. Um, similar to the way that the SQL works, we basically have like sort of serialization and deserialization pools uh, ongoing in LMD. So you can have like a thousand peers and only use uh, you know like 500 like kilobytes of memory as opposed to like the prior version of LMD which would actually assign like a 65 kilobyte buffer to like each peer connection uh, or each peer and connection so it ends up being like a lot of people have boomed and especially if you have a floppy peer and this fixes all those issues and there's even more improvements in that 61 which will be coming out tomorrow maybe. <laughs> Great. All right. <laughs> That's for today. And thank you.
and waiting for it to come down. So you said that you're tracking, like the, the sweeper yeah. uh, tracks until when the fee rate is at a certain level, yeah. and then it broadcasts tra transactions. Well, it'll, it'll Why don't you just submit them at the specific transaction fee that you want it and wait for them to come through? Uh, you can do that. Some of them are time sensitive, so like at some point you have to make those decisions as well. Um, but it'll basically say, like, oh, this is too slow. Um, well, part, part of the reason also is just like at the moment it only tracks like one single transaction at a time. There's like there's ongoing work to like split that up into actually doing like multiple like debugging and stuff like that. Um, so it will get more advanced as we as we continue. But uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Also, just submit them away. Your channel will be down as soon as you do that, so you can't use it as soon as you start to correct. Yeah. So I mean, there are certain things that have like a higher time preferences. Like you want to speed reaches with a higher key rate, then you care about like a time on that expires next week or something like that. Um, and that having that like budget. is a little bit slower now, uh, so especially if there's no system on the network, it might take you quite a bit longer to figure out uh, state changes there. So I'm trying to look around and, and gauge uh, time, given the information that's available to me on the global network graph, how much I do something like that. Um, if you want to gauge up time, you should probably just connect to them. Um, yeah, Gossip and, L uh, and LNDE, our previous sort of like trickle delay, which is sort of the interval which we like broadcast patches uh, of, of gossip information. We basically like this into all our peers and then after an hour, 90 seconds, we'll you do anything that comes in and send you like the latest ones out to like any peers that want this want that information. So that sort of like delta has become uh, even less about, or greater in about six, which means that uh, the dissemination of traffic will be a little bit slower than it was before as well. Um, so you probably you probably shouldn't rely on that either. Um, some nodes because of also the new reworking of the channel status manager um, a node could go, go down and come back up, but you may not actually get an announcement for it because of the damage. Um, so I would recommend if you really wanted to track it on just connect to people. Last question. 